Hello, welcome to the We Are Two Cities podcast. My name is Micah Foster. I'm the pastor of Two Cities Church in Fresno and Clovis, California, and Two Cities Online, where we meet virtually these days. Today's conversation uh, circles around a friendship that I have with Paul Haugen, who's one of our launch team members and, uh, and one of my best friends for a long, long time. We talk about a lot of personal things, a lot of uh, things that we have not talked about publicly, and, uh, and I hope that you find this content very fun, engaging, and personal. Uh, we are celebrating our six-year anniversary as a church, and th- so this is kind of a celebration of that friendship and what it led to in terms of planting a church together. And so I hope that it's fun, helpful, uh, in- insightful. And if you enjoy this content, this is episode three, by the way, and if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel uh, and also the podcast. The podcast can be found on all the major podcast platforms. So just search We Are Two Cities and, uh, and you'll find it there. I hope you love this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. Well, thanks, Paul, for coming over and hanging out with me for a little bit. Yeah, and uh, thank you for the world's largest uh, glass. I do what I can. You asked if I wanted water, and I was like, ah, I could I could drink a little water, and you gave me what appears to be like a jug of moonshine <laughs> in this mason jar. <laughs> That's it's how we do. This refreshing. is what I do. This is what You need a lot of water every day. This is what I do to stay hydrated. You gotta drink way more water than you think. That's what Doc McStuffin says. <sighs> I have been dehydrated in the hospital a couple of times. So you I, have. I've been called to the emergency room <laughs> yes. to uh, sit with you. That that that's the thing. Yeah, that, that's happened. And on more than one occasion, I've taken you to the emergency room as well. Yeah. So a set design gone uh, wrong. Uh, yeah, you still have a scar on your hand. I do. Right? I have a scar right uh, right there. I don't know if we can see that. Previous Probably life. Not. Previous life, yeah. So what happened there? You want to tell me what happened? We were doing a, we were working at a church in Santa Rosa, mm-hmm. um, as you know. Yeah, um, I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, mostly it's for them. But uh, working at a church in Santa Rosa, and we were doing a set design, and um, I had a bunch of volunteers there to help, and we rented a man lift, you know, like one one bucket deal where you, you know, set out the rigors and the safety it you know, protocols. It lifts men, yes. It lifts got, men, you know, so it. you can get up high. Um, and, you know, the thing weighs 300, 400 pounds, right? Um but it got delivered and I was like, you know, we had these kind of two, maybe three, uh, steps, uh, up onto the stage and everyone's kind of talking and, and you know, all that. And the, the, uh, the maintenance guy, Gary, right before we did this tells me, um, <laughs> Hey, these things are really slick. Like actually right. one person can, can lift this. What you do is you pull this little bar slick, out on like the back. Cool. This is really awesome. Yeah. It was like, a, he's like, these things are really innovative, um, and well-designed cause you can pull this little, uh, you know, lever out and, right. It'll give you a brace and then you just tip it back and then you can sort of roll it forward and go. Right. And I was like, huh, that's ingenious. So everyone's on the stage kind of gathered around chatting and I'm like, well, make myself useful and move this onto the stage for everybody. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in the aisle way where the chairs are and I, you know, lean, I pull the thing out safety first, you know, like Gary told me cause Gary's qualified. Right. Right. Um, absolutely. And I pull the thing back and it just keeps coming and like it, it, it fell and trapped me between uh, the, the man lift and the chairs and, uh, smashed my hand pretty good. I was worried that I would not be able to play guitar anymore, which would not be a loss for many people. Cause I just kind of hold it. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> but then, then I was like, you know, bleeding everywhere and, uh, you were not there. Thanks for the help. Right. Um, and I was I, in the shower actually. Right. I called you, home. but you didn't answer, uh, there when I need you. So I called Erica, uh, and was like, Hey, and she's the one you want to call when you have a medical when you're emergency. like when you have an open wound. Yes, yeah, Erica she's the Foster one. is the one to reach out to, <laughs> and um, so I called her, and I, I was aware that she does not like blood and and all that. So right. I was very uh, gentle over the phone and was like, "So, uh, is Micah available?" And <laughs> she was like, "Well, he's in the shower." And I said, "I'm going to need him to come pick me up. A man lift fell on me, and uh, I'm going to need him to take me to the hospital." And so she immediately freaked out yeah. and ran and got you apparently. But what I didn't know, and I found out later, is that she thought I was trapped under the yes. man lift still. I thought I was coming to lift the man lift off to you. You know, I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm not that strong. Right. But So anyway, but then I drove to your house with a uh, my hand bleeding and you took me to the hospital. And Eight stitches later, I was 
you know, I got out of the stage design, so that was cool. It was that was good times. We had some good times there in Santa Rosa. We but did. That's that's the fun. thing is we've known each other for we were trying to figure this out, like twenty six years or something. I think twenty three. Twenty three years. We were sixteen. I'm about to be forty, so it's uh, going on twenty four years. There you go. Long time. So I've known a long you longer than time. I didn't know you. That's that's true. I've known you longer than I've known my wife. That's crazy. That's weird. I have not known you longer than I've known my wife. Well, yeah. Yeah. But so we, I mean, we've had a lot of fun and experiences. We've been around each other a long time. We've been really good friends for a really long time. And, uh, you know, how we met, first of all, I transferred schools. I went to Buchanan for Uh a year and a half, and then I transferred to Clovis West along with Gerald Goldstein. Uh, and, uh, And so we transferred on the same day, and we met... Um, well, because we were dating sisters, right? Which we don't well, need to get well choir, like, choir deep into and, that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. we were, we were. Uh, well, let's just say that I mean, the family was lovely, yeah, great family. But mm-hmm. <clears throat> after a while, it it got to be that uh, you and I like went to each other for a little bit of you know commiserating, a little bit of sense of normalcy. We're sixteen, we're sixteen, right? we're punks. You yeah, know, absolutely. Nothing, nothing on them. It was us. Right. We were exactly. We were but there are some fun stories there. But uh, yeah, choir. We uh, I don't know if uh, people know this that you're a, an amazing uh, bass singer. Um, <laughs> uh, not not like a like a cello kind of bass, but like a you, you're, uh, a, uh, you're you're the low guy. I used to be able to hit some <clears throat> lower notes. Right, that's true. And in yeah. fact, I don't know. Are we? We're just gonna share this. You and I were in a boy band together. Uh, we're sharing but before this we get now. That, let me share. This is my first. I was thinking about this earlier today. My first memory of hanging out with you, because we, because we had dated sisters, and and so we sort of saw each other in passing, you know, um, and and you know commiserated and all that stuff. But the first time we kind of hung out as like proper chums, friends, right? Right. Um, it was me, you, and I think John Grog, maybe uh, it might have been Eric Medeiros. <clears throat> um, shout out Eric. I can't remember, but it was another. It was another person in the car. Mm-hmm. And we were driving around in your, uh, in your, was it your dad's or your mom's Impala? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like this was when the Impala was re- remade and was it w- like. It was a nice. It was a nice Impala. ride. Impala. It was a very nice ride. And it had a sunroof. Moonroof. So, Moonroof. Yeah. Well, that's important. It was definitely a moonroof because we got one of those <laughs> cheesy uh, Seymour Buns dolls, like one of these prank uh. dolls. If you're not familiar with this, it is like, it's, it's a guy who's got his hands like on his waist Right. And, and then there's a little like hose and it goes down to a little, little ball and mm-hmm. you squeeze the ball and he drops his pants to moon people. And his name is Seymour butts or buns. I can't remember. And yeah. so we drove around river park. This is, this is like when river park was like brand new. Yeah, this it was, was like new. 98, 99. Yeah, it was the place to be. It was the place to be. Uh, and we drove around and we would like have Seymour buns like wedged into the moonroof. Like you open so it, it looked like there. he was standing. So it looks like he's just standing there. On the roof of the car. And then we would get people's attention, uh, and then they would look, and we would you know, press the thing, down his pants would go, mooning people, and we drove away laughing. Little did we know, like it was dark outside. They probably couldn't really even see. I do remember a couple of people, like at a stop sign or a stoplight, they roll up behind us, and so they're looking at it. What is that? And then... And he pulls because down. we yeah we like right we behind. drove down Blackstone <laughs> right Avenue behind. with Seymour Buns, uh, uh, letting it all hang out. Okay, and, and here's the thing: the reason we're kind of going into our history, right, and why why we're talking so much about us, yeah, right, because we're not all about us, right? We're not about Jesus, yeah, that's right? True, okay, that's true. Uh, if if you go all the way back. These friendship roots is what God started in the very beginning to eventually sprout out to all the thif- all the different things that we've done together, including two cities. And so, as we celebrate six years yeah. in this church, uh, having launched six years ago, we're kind of backtracking and talking a little bit about how we developed to that point. So, it was really immature. That's how that's how it all started. Right, it all started. It's not it like this, started with, it wasn't a powerful prayer meeting no, or anything like that. No. We, we, it started with Seymour Buns. That's and, right. And Crazy Sisters. Um yeah. So I you know, and then we were in a boy band together. That was kind of the big uh the the big turning point. Actually, <laughs> uh, you know what? I was thinking about this the other day. Do you remember when there was a uh it was a bonfire? Uh-huh. For Clovis West, it was like a homecoming or something. <laughs> it was like it was a pep a, rally. Yeah, 
but it was outside and there was a bond, which I don't think they can do anymore. I don't know. Open flames. We had, we were performing a song at that. Well, because they used to do, they used to do at lunchtime. Like, oh yes. They would have yes. like, just music out on the quad and me, you. It was and, like Fridays or something. Yeah. Like Fridays. And me and you and Gerald went up and sang a song together and I barely knew the words, but I sort of knew the melody. And we sang it together, and it went over really well. It was a big hit, and so they asked us to come and sing <laughs> at the at the bonfire that night. What was it? Do you remember what song it was? It was yes, it was uh, um, it was as yet. I was just gonna say maybe and it was like they <laughs> they one of the many like great R and B groups from the nineties, and they covered the Peter Cetera song. Um, and after all that's been said and done, that one. Okay. I can't remember. I can't remember the words, but um, but yeah, that was the song. And so we sang that at lunchtime. I didn't really know it. And then they asked us to come back and sing maybe that same song that night. And I remember we went and it was the first time you realized that I had a lot of trouble hearing like pitch. You like pulled out a pitch pipe and we're like, <laughs> here's where we're starting. Which if you like for those that don't know, if you're going to sing in a group and do harmony, it helps if you're all in the same key. Right. right, like it's sort of, right. You know, so you can't all start in your own keys right. and it so work out. I, like I was singing the lead, uh, because that's all I was qualified to do, and and I could not. Like you would blow into your pitch pipe, and I'm like, uh huh, got it. I'm gonna do anything <laughs> other than that. And uh, and it was not. I remember it not being a great performance, but somehow from there, I think we were in three different keys. I think so. I think that's. What I think it was. Gerald walked away halfway through it. <laughs> he was like, was I'm done. Like, I'm on the football team. I'm not, I'm not doing <laughs> yeah. this. Like you guys are on your own. And I, somehow from there we decided, well, we should do this on a more regular basis. And yeah. Cause this went over so well, <clears throat> like gangbusters. We should, yeah. we should make this a thing. Right. So we, um, we formed a boy band. We recruited a couple of people. Yep. A couple, uh, couple of guys, Bobby Norris and Matt right. Parker. That's the right. other two. And then, I remember the day before our first rehearsal, you told me, hey, we were at a party last night <laughs> and there was karaoke, uh, karaoke and we met another guy who can sing. And so we just invited him to come along um, named John. And, and you were like, oh, like okay. sure. I, I don't know this guy. I trust you guys. And uh, <laughs> he, did, he did actually write our best song. Yeah, he wrote our best song, yeah. <laughs> but then we, so we, so we got a, uh, a manager a local manager, Willie Ray Moore, who actually are we naming names on this? Thing? I, I guess, guess we are. It's on the internet. <laughs> I guess so. He actually, he actually agreed to be on the Two Cities podcast at some point. Nice. Oh, we should have brought him in. That we be, should have. Here he is, Ray. Uh, yeah, here, yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be Welcome, someone who knows something. Um, <laughs> this is so and so show reference for all you older upstreet Upstreet's. parents. You yeah. got to watch so and so show with your kids. Um, but there's uh, so so Ray uh, came a couple of years ago. To our, like our fourth, fourth anniversary, anniversary yeah. I think it was, and played drums with uh, a trio, I think it was, of his that he plays with, and then uh, I think the Ray Moore Experience. I think that's what they're called. That's what uh, it, that's what it is. They're fantastic. You should check. Here's them out. what I remember. Here's what I remember about Willie Ray Moore. Okay, okay. Junior, right? Junior. Yeah, I think is so. he a Junior. I think you're. you're I think junior. so. I'm saying I'm saying it like you're watching. Comment below, it. Ray. Are yes. you Willie exactly. Moore Junior? <laughs> uh, by the way, I don't know if it's out there that his name is Willie Ray Moore, so I apologize for William. It. Is it? I don't know. I don't know. He might just be Willie. I don't know. It's Bill at this point. I don't. I don't know okay. what it is. But what I do remember, Billy Ray Moore. <laughs> <laughs> what I do remember is that he really had this dream of starting this sort of entertainment place. Uh, I don't know what you call it, a lounge or something. A consortium. But he he wanted to call it Ray's Boom Boom <laughs> Room. Okay, but here's the great part. During COVID, he's been live streaming Ray's Boom Boom Isn't Room. Isn't that great? So many years later. So anyways, gotta love it's entertaining. It. Gotta I've, love I've jumped Moore. on and he's giving me a shout out. So Ray, Ray's the best. He sang our song on Ray's Boom Boom Room. I know, he, like, that's like 20 years later he remembers yeah. this. I wonder if I can find that clip. If I can, I'll okay. punch it in. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Hey, y'all, listen. Years ago, there was this group. It was what? Hey, Mike, it was four or five of y'all. Four or five of young, young, young white boys that could sing, that could rap. I mean, no, sing and write. Oh, they were awesome. Now, they are youth leaders and pastors of churches. And I got the absolute privilege to 
to manage them and rear them for a little while in their music years ago. But they had this song, uh, Oh, I messed up again, committed all the sin and lost control. Oh, Father, I long to see your face. I need your love and grace to save me now. Why did I ever turn from you? Lord, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Lord, humble me before you. God, I want to give my all to you. Woo! Micah, yeah, 1999. That was a couple years ago, bro. But, uh, but yeah, like, I, you know, it's important to point out because when we started, this was, this was 99. So like yeah. I was, I had just your graduated high school. Year. Yeah. Okay. And we like launched. So you were going to be, it was the summer before your senior year. Mm. I had just graduated and we, we kicked this thing off. And in 1999, if you go back, like this was the dawn of the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC oh, were yeah. kind of starting to roll. But we were convinced that we would be more like boys to men. Because oh, sure. that's who we, you you and I both. I, I was R and B of nineties R and B. I was like boys to men, Brian Knight. So we, like, yeah, come we, on. We never wanted to be the the, but you know, five white guys wearing matching turtlenecks yeah. and cargo <laughs> pants, like they were turtleneck sweaters from Old Navy. It could not get structure any more, actually. I think, but maybe yeah, yeah, it could not get any more uh, like an in sync ripoff than what we. Oh, it was crazy. What we did so. Um, yeah, I, I, we want you and I. I think for sure wanted to be boys to men, and that was just absolutely not, that was not uh, happening. Because boys to men, there's less choreography. Oh, for sure. You st- it's like you 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 do it on like the strength of your voice and and your songs, and you know, we wound up having some dance moves that were not great. Like it was a lot of shoulder stuff, like you know, mm-hmm. little bouncing yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it wasn't. It's, it's not, like you know. Not, okay. Neither one of us. Think about our this. Forte, right. Think about this. It's like, uh, what's that movie with Will Smith? Um, oh, uh, Hitch. Yes, he's Hitch. Like, this is where you live. He's like, yeah. this is home. Elbows Don't go degrees. from yeah. here. That's, that was it. Yeah, That's that, was, what, but that was, we were before that, and we should have really taken that. That was it. But yeah. we, we practiced for hours. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we were good. Like In a living joke. room there's, on the west there's side. footage somewhere. Like, we, were, we were good, and 13-year-old girls loved us Yeah, somewhere. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. Not really the demo we were going for, but that's... So kind of you it. went away to college. I did. I went away to college. You, you abandoned us. Well, the, I mean, and my parents will tell you this, like, I I went away to college just kind of waiting for our record deal. Oh, so did I. So I didn't, like, study or go to class much at all for the first year, <laughs> which caught up to me. It'll, it'll catch up with you. You got to go to class. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So, it's not so all great, those Zoom not ditchers out there. Yeah. Not a great plan to go away to school and um, and wait to be discovered. It doesn't right. really work that way. But we had we actually went uh we went to Universal <clears throat> City Walk. Yeah. Okay, so here's the deal. We there was a producer or somebody, right? Mm-hmm. That Ray knew through someone that was out in LA visiting from where was he from? Detroit or Detroit, something? yeah. And he, which he, like believe it or not, gospel music, I mean Detroit's a big uh big Yeah. Deal. I was like, this is awesome. This is this is our break. Yeah. So we drive down there, and he's like, "Yeah, we're gonna go to Universal uh, Studios. You're gonna sing for him. You know, we're gonna kind of try did to hash think, something out." When he said Universal Studios and sing for a producer, did you think we were going to like a studio? I thought, I no, thought like I, an office okay. or something. I thought, I thought, yeah, cool. So we'll go to Universal City Walk or somewhere around there. But then there will be like this suite somewhere that we meet in. Yeah, and he's in like this. This uh, office that they gave him for the day, since he's in town right, or whatever. Right. That's what I thought. That's what I thought I was walking That's into. I, yeah, we wound up singing for this guy in a parking garage. In a parking garage. Which, um, hey, if you got a shot, you gotta you gotta take it and wherever you're at. Frankly, again, I mean, we were good. Like the, <laughs> the parking garage acoustics were. I mean, I remember finishing that and being like, we crushed that. <laughs> like when you're 19 years old and this is your dream, it's like this. We nailed it. Oh. We we just absolutely <clears throat> obliterated this thing. It was fantastic. Okay. But I remember, <clears throat> I mean, as goofy as those times were, there was still, and this is sort of, I, I think, a through line for our friendship, is that there was still like a connection to wanting to, you know, have an impact. Like we we genuinely, like I had I had really just gotten serious about my faith my senior year of high school, um, 
you had been really serious about your faith for the last few years. And so like, we really were viewing this as a ministry. Like we were singing yeah. about Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, this was not to get girls or anything like that. We, you know, like we were serious about this. And I remember you even called me at one point and had seen this documentary about, um, you know, uh, poor working conditions in Guatemala, you know, or something. <laughs> See, I don't something remember like this like, conversation I remember you, at all. You, but... told, you, you like, uh, set, you know, called me and were like, there was this video that I saw, uh, you know, about a major uh, coffee uh, company uh, that we all know <laughs> that, you know, is treating workers poorly in some third world country and, and we should do something about this. And I was like, yes, I got no idea what, yes, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, we should do something about that. But, and, and that sort of became a through line for a lot of, right. a lot of our endeavors. Well, I think one of the things that we really tried to do during the boy band days was we tried to, uh, we tried to cross lines that were drawn artificially. Mm-hmm. So, um, like cultural lines and yeah. racial lines. Cause I remember we, we would be in a church on the West side where the only white guys in there and they're inviting us in to sing. And I was just ecstatic to be there Yeah, and they would let us, you know, do our thing. Sometimes they would join in with their own instruments <laughs> because that's just the culture, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it was really fun and it was sort of like this music uh, kind of unites us, you know, the message yeah, really obviously bridge, unites bridge us, but, but the music really, so I felt like what we were doing was, was sort of bridging a gap there, bridging a, a relational gap that mm-hmm. is still there. And there's still, we're, we're always trying to figure out how do we do that better, you know? Yeah. And especially in today's uh, times, we want to figure out how to do that better. But I felt like that was a big thing for us back then is, 17 year olds, 16 year olds, whatever, whatever we were, you were 18, probably I was 17, yeah, 19, probably. so that was a big deal, but it didn't work out. Yeah. The band didn't work Surprisingly, out. Surprisingly, a Christian boy band from Fresno. So you went, didn't go all the way. You went away to college a year before me. I went away to college. When I went away to college for the first half of the year, we were still, uh, we were still trying to make the boy band thing work. We did a thing in Bakersfield. We did a thing in San Diego. We, we mm-hmm. still met up and did things, but it just wasn't as regular. Yeah. And so it kind of died away. We had to, we had to concentrate on other priorities. Right. Yeah. It just, it just didn't become, it wasn't feasible to. Yeah. It wasn't priority yeah. number one anymore. Bobby went to the Marines. We had to right. you know, we went from like five guys to four guys and then we added a guy. It was, yeah. we had the, the members were changing. The whole thing was changing. So right, it just right, didn't, right. it wasn't yeah. working anymore. But, uh, so we pursued our own things. We went uh, and did our own ministries on the campuses we were involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, you got involved with Campus Crusade for Christ. Yep. Now crew, but yeah. Yes. And I was involved with the campus ministry on, on the campus at mm-hmm. uh, Pepperdine. And you were at Pomona. Cal Poly Pomona. Go Broncos. And so there's one time. Okay, I got to bring this up because I'm drinking a giant glass oh, this reminded you yeah of water well i think we should preface this by saying that you have the bladder of a 65 year old that woman. is because n- <laughs> i know what you're gonna say you're gonna make me out to be the bad guy in this story okay but here's the thing we had a gig yeah at my school uh-huh and for whatever reason you i don't think you had a car i didn't have a car my freshman year so i had to drive from pomona to Malibu, it's like 60 miles like 60 miles on a friday afternoon yeah. which la traffic la traffic's not fun Took me like an hour and a half to get there. I pick you up, and then we turned around to go back. Right, uh, and we were like, we're running late. It's said like we're we're behind, and like this whole thing is a is an event that our campus ministry is doing at the dorm, and and part of it is like having us perform. And we're late, and I'm like, we are going, and you're you're like, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I was like, I had to go hold so it, bad, Paul. we're not doing this, and you you're like fidgeting in your seat oh yeah and like i was bouncing around i had i was sweating i'm I was, starting to sweat right now thinking about it i was i was sweating i was it, so mad at you that, we, that you made me stop because i was like we are late. no we didn't stop i i held it the whole way no we pulled it was like off, it was like an hour and a half on like this uh this little gas station this little we definitely stopped we remember that differently and i was i was really it took a long time for me to stop you were it may oh have, yeah it may have i was like, like guys 
I was like, Paul, I've got to stop. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So we went there. We did the whole thing. But so we had some interaction through college, but that was one of the last things I think we did because you were so mad at me. Well, um, I remember you were the first. <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were the first person that I, I, I think that I knew that was like, I want to make a difference. And that resonated with me. Like we, I, I don't think we knew what it was, right? We're trying to do a lot of different right. things, but like, I remember it, even in high school, you were a guy that was like, I want to make an impact. And I was like, Oh, I thought I was the only one that wanted to do that. And, and so I, that stuck with me. So then fast forward several years later, I like I was, you know, going into ministry and, and, you know, applying for jobs at churches. I applied everywhere for, you know, 10 months all over the country and finally found a church in Clovis where someone understood my resume and was like, Hey, this, this matters. Right. Um, and so we drove up, uh, to interview at Clovis Hills and I got the job Clovis Hills community church. Um, and I remember calling you, we hadn't spoken probably in months and I called you and was like, Hey, don't laugh at me, but I'm moving back to Fresno. And then what did you say? I said, so am I. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Like we, but, but what's crazy about that is like, I don't know, nine months earlier than that or 10 months or a year earlier, you called me and said, yeah, these were like, we talked twice in a year. Yeah. And the first time it was me telling you, Hey, um, I'm going to ask Jen to marry me. And then you were like, that's funny. I'm going to ask Erica to marry me. Yep. And then we were like, oh, we got to plan this. We're, we're both thinking August. And so <laughs> so you were like, we're thinking August 11th, right? 13th. 13th. Yeah, that's right. You're a day after. So August 13th. And I was like, great. We'll do August 20th. And then my mom couldn't do it for some reason. And right. So we moved it to the Friday before August 12th. So we missed each other's weddings because we were idiots. Well, mostly me, I guess, but... I gave you the date, we locked it in, and then I changed it. And then you changed it. We would have been in each other's weddings. Well, having my mom there was more then, important well, than having you I there. I guess. I suppose. So, um, Whatever. But yeah. So but, the, and then you guys ended up getting married on the beach in Malibu, like 10 minutes from where my dorm was, but right. it was in the summer, and so I wasn't. we were in Fresno. It was just a whole, yeah. a whole thing. Whole thing. Switcheroo. So I caught, and then, so that happened. We got married. Everything's good. And then, <clears throat> like nine months later, hey- don't laugh at me. I'm going back to Fresno. You were like, me too. We had both been in Fresno the same 4th of July weekend interviewing at different churches, both That's got right. the job. And then like you moved up a week before we did. Mm-hmm. And then we moved back. You came and visited us when I, when you and Erica, when we were moving in, that was, I mean, I guess Jen and Erica had met before then, but that was like one of the first times that they had yeah. really met. And chatted. we had to kind of kickstart their friendship. We did. We, we had, had to kind of force had to them keep saying to like, Hey, I'd like to hang out go. with Micah. Get coffee can or you, whatever. Like, can you be friends with Erica? And now that now they text all the time. So what we did during that time when we were both in Fresno, Clovis, we were both newlyweds, we're both uh, working at churches, mm-hmm. uh, believing anything's possible and we can do whatever, right? And we found a lot of camaraderie in being young punks in ministry, thinking we know everything. There was a lot of that. For sure. <laughs> so for we sure. so we hung out all the time, Friday nights, whatever. Uh, we had some other people hang out with us. Who else hung out with us during that time? Uh, a couple of times, uh, the Mondays. Luke and Sarah, yeah. yes, hung out with us, and I think even Eric Medeiros came one time or something. Yeah, but I think so. we so we had some some people. Oh, and there was another ministry couple that hung out with us a little bit. I can't remember who it was. Um, but they moved away. They moved to like Texas or something. So oh, we're yeah, yeah. all from different Doing churches and stuff. Man. And we, yeah. And we, uh, he went, he went, he went to be a police officer actually. And then oh, wow. he's been like six things anyway. So, uh, we found camaraderie. We would hang out and then eventually we were just like, you know what? This is, this is really cool. We should actually just start a church together. Yeah, well, I think I think we were both feeling a little like, hey, the churches that we're at are, at least I was, I won't put words in your mouth, the church that I'm at is great, but all of the stories of like God moving and doing things and people's lives being changed happened before I got there. And so now it was like maintaining, right? And we, like, I loved my time there. I love the people there. We did some amazing things, 
um, at Clovis Hills. I got to I got to learn a ton. I played with right. amazing musicians. It was a great time. Mm-hmm. But I I always felt like I want to have like I want to have my footprint or fingerprint probably is more apt term my fingerprint on on this. Like I want to I want to you know lead not just you know kind of come in and and manage. And and we had a lot of those conversations that right. we wanted a place where we could invite our <clears throat> friends to, <clears throat> and didn't feel like those you know, our, our, the churches we were at were, were necessarily that. Right. And that, that was the whole thing is like, we wanted to, we wanted a place that we felt like, I think you said it well, that we could invite our friends to. So what was really interesting about that is that initially you felt a strong call to San Francisco and I, I did not. Yeah. I, like I remember feeling like, you know, when you're, when you're 26, 27, um, it's like everyone's a moron. Except for you, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so no one knows anything. Everyone else is a chicken. They're scared, and so mm-hmm. I, had, I had created this narrative in my head. Even though, like, I'm sure there are amazing church planning movements in the city of San Francisco. I'm sure there are people that, and we've met some that are doing amazing. There are things now for sure, and and yeah. doing unbelievable things in the city. I, I was convinced, and and kind of created this narrative in my head that the church had abandoned the city of San Francisco. That it was too, too homeless, too gay, too dirty to, you know, whatever. Right. Um, and so that while, while the church was leaving and was too uncomfortable with walking into the mess that we, we should be people that go and, and, you know, share the love of Jesus with people. And wouldn't this be amazing? We could create this, this movement in, in San Francisco. And I like Jen and I were on board and we were like, I think we're going to do this. I think this is where God's moving. Right. And so we asked you guys, Hey, you should come with us. What if we planted a church in San Francisco, and I think you guys laughed for like a minute and a half because <laughs> you're like, we're not, we're not going to San Francisco. Yeah. We just moved back. Like you know, we, we'd only been here for less than a year, I think. Maybe it's a little, Maybe a little long. Okay, anyway, we hadn't been here. We hadn't been back that long, and and I just remember leaving and being like, huh, well, I guess maybe they're not in, but God was doing some other things. Yeah, and and I remember. You know, and you initially you were like, and I think you could be the, the lead pastor, and I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah. I'm in student ministry, I never want to leave student ministry. That's my gig, um, which was naive because eventually everyone leaves student ministry because you can't keep up. Right. You can't keep up with all the, the students. Anyways, at some point, junior high kids stop being cute, and they just yeah. become jerks. <laughs> yeah. So, uh. It's, but then Erica and I had prayed about it. We talked about it a bunch of times. And then one day I just remember we're, we're doing the dishes. And I'm like, you know what? I think maybe, maybe we could go. Yeah. And maybe, maybe I could be. And so that started, that was like, really? You think that? Really? You think that? We both felt that way. And so it started us down this road of discovery. Mm-hmm. So we started actually meeting our hangouts turned into hey let's uh let's uh grow together in our leadership skills let's listen to podcasts and do books together and and then and let's pray every week about what this could look like which then led us to a vision trip a little mini vacation slash vision trip to san francisco which was just a blast i I still think that was one of the best trips that i've ever been on like we just went and kind of explored the city you know like it was one of the first times I'd been to San Francisco and it wasn't about like getting clam chowder in a bread bowl. It was right. you know, or like seeing the Giants play. It was like, let's explore and let's see what's out here. Let's ride public transportation as far as it'll take us. Go right. to every little uh, portion of the city. Yeah. Let's, you know, let's let's go exploring. And so that's what we did. Yeah. And and, you know, we met with some people and we looked at, you know, some different things right. and thought about, you know, you had set up some of these meetings. <clears throat> and one of the meetings that you set up was with Andy Vomstig in uh, Santa Rosa. And so we went up there and we watched, uh, we went to uh, church at New Vintage mm-hmm. that morning. Um, and then we had lunch with Andy afterwards. And, um, and I remember being like, like we walked into that church and I was like, this is what we should do. Like this is, right. the, this is the kind of ministry that we should, we should build. And what was it about, I mean, what was it about that, that, cause I had that same feeling, but if you could describe it, 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 well, it felt like, um, it felt like we were like, they were doing, um, 
I don't, they were doing church for unchurched people. Like they were doing church for people that, that didn't know Jesus. And mm-hmm. so, um, so I don't know, like everything was designed for the, the guest in mind. Right. Everything was designed for, you know, like, um, for the community that they were in, it was smaller. And so it felt like, you know, there's definitely room to, to build and, and to grow and all that kind of stuff. So there just was an energy there that was like, they're, they're in, you know, in, in go mode, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went to lunch with Andy and he actually floated the idea like, Hey, why don't you come and work here? for a little bit. Right. We'll train you and then we'll send you out to, to plant. And uh, you know, there were some twists and turns along the way, but, yeah. but like over the next few months, that's kind of what, what happened. Like mm-hmm. you, you went there first. Erica and I moved. Erica was pregnant. Yeah. You know, there's kind of, kind of some miracles in there and in, in kind of how God provided for us because new vintage, uh, didn't really have the resources to bring us, but we brought, we came on the promise of, medical insurance and a roof over our head. Yeah. It's amazing how important health insurance is. Like, which was great because our oldest son, Josiah, uh, was born there, uh, 11 years ago. Crazy. Which is nuts. And it cost us $25 for his birth. So that was some good. Me- so it was That's great. Not nothing. That's pretty great. That was yeah. great. Yeah. Um, but you know, food was a little hard to come by at times and other things were a little hard to come I by. I love the story. Tell, can you tell the story about the pizzas? Yeah, so so there was someone would come by like twice a month. I think they worked in a grocery store or something, and they would offload these frozen pizzas that were newly expired. They could not be sold. I didn't know frozen pizza went bad, by the way, but I guess it must. Yeah, it does. Um, and they were like, we can't legally sell these, but, you know, if you guys can use them. So we would, we stuffed them in the fridge or the freezer at, the church campus, and then when we were low on food, I'd go grab 10 and take them home. <laughs> I'm like, nobody else is eating these things. So <laughs> What I love about that is, like, th- there's a couple sentences you said in there that really cracked me up. One is, uh, I would go grab 10. Like, it's not like I would take one. It's like, well, I needed, I needed to eat gro- the whole week. And the other know? one is, like, we can't legally sell these. <laughs> so if you put those together, we can't legally sell these. I'll grab 10 that, that tickles me. That makes me laugh. So, hard. well, you know, you do what you gotta do. Sometimes you're in survival mode. I remember I was in a meeting with, because when I showed up, he hadn't told any of the staff I was coming. So I just showed up into the office and I guess it was a Monday and he worked remote on Monday. Like he did prep at home and stuff for the right. message. And so I showed up, I walked into the front office and I remember someone sitting at the little reception desk and goes, can I help you? I'm like, yeah, I'm Micah. I'm Micah. reporting for duty. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, I'm new here. I'm I'm coming to work here. She's like, why don't you have a seat? I'm gonna call Andy because so he then told anyone that I was right. that was coming, and it was kind of an experiment. Not exactly a, like a thriving HR department at uh, correct at New Vintage when correct. you showed up. Yeah, and, and he, it was, you know, part of it was on purpose. He was trying to shake things up a little bit, I think, and so. Uh, but I just remember no job description, no title, nothing. I, I had to literally, I, I worked for like three weeks from my iPhone sitting in the lobby. I didn't have my own desk. I didn't have a computer. And so I was creating my own job. I was taking a look around and I was going, what needs to be done? Would you mind if I took that off your plate? And I was just collecting Right. things to do and trying to implement systems and all this stuff. And so I loved it because I had come from a, an environment that was not as free and not as, yeah, just try things, just do things and, and try and fail and grow. It was like, do it this way. If you don't do it this way, it's, it's, we're gonna have a problem. So I didn't have freedom where I came from, but suddenly I had freedom and it really, really, really it felt great. Yeah. Didn't pay great at the time. But I remember but you sitting, got those pizzas. I did get those pizzas. And I remember uh, sitting in a meeting with Andy. He was looking looking over budget stuff. And he goes, tell me, uh, he's looking at me on my phone. It's like, you're working a lot from your phone. How much is your cell phone bill? I told him. He's like, we're going to take care of that. And I started crying 
because things were so tight and yeah. we were we were losing money, you know, it yeah. was like so tight and I started, crying. and so just incrementally things eventually got to the point where I was salaried and everything. He thought that I was going to, I think he thought when I came up there that I was going to find some, you know, job and s- somehow do like a, um, you know, bivocational, bivocational or trivocational work it out, whatever. But I was like, I'm focused on this is what I'm doing. So, so he, you know, eventually got me up to, up to par. Yeah. And then after I got up to par, it was like, Hey Andy, we need someone to fill this position and I need to move over to another spot. Mm-hmm. How about we're, we bring Paul up. And then, so then you found your way up there as well. Yeah. And we had a grand old time doing some real fun <laughs> stuff. Because it was still like, I mean, you guys left and then I was, I was at, you know, Jen and I were at Clovis Hills and, and I was getting sort of the opposite experience. I was getting more responsibility, more opportunity, but mm-hmm. then getting like really great coaching. Like still Kimberly McNeil was my boss, greatest uh, person I've ever worked for. Like she was like allowing me to try things and fail. So like I was able to take risks and grow and, right. and um, but it still never felt like mine. And I don't mean mine in like a, you know, I want the credit kind of way, but it was like, you know, right. uh, it, it wasn't a place where like I could, you know, what we were doing could be an expression of like what God was right. you know, speaking. And so there's, there was still this like itch to get up there. Um, and I remember like when we finally, you know, took that leap and, and made that move, I was like, okay, we're doing this within, within a couple of years, we'll be in San Francisco. Right. That was a plan. Because that was the dream. That, like that was the dream that I was holding on to. It was like, we're going to the city. That was the, that was the moral imperative. Right. Um, and so it was like, all right, we're doing this. And so as we got to Santa Rosa, as, as great as it was, I love the the town. I love the church, love the people as great as it was. It was like, this isn't, this isn't forever. We're here for a couple of years and then we're going to San Francisco. And then we had a night of worship. Mm-hmm. This was a defining moment. Yeah. Uh, and I think you've told the story, but like we, we were at this night of worship. I was, I was leading worship and then we would, and we would stop playing and then we would show these baptism videos. And there was this woman, Lori, who mm-hmm. had come to the church. She had actually driven around the parking lot three, three weeks in a row and was like, maybe I'll go in today. And couldn't, couldn't get up the nerve. And on the fourth Sunday, she said, it's either go in or drive my car off a cliff. And so she came in, was greeted by all sorts of people who loved on her and cared for her. And then over that next year, she, you know, she cleaned the toilets. Like she did everything right. at the church, like was just around it all the time. And then she was getting baptized. And this was a huge moment because we had all sort of seen Lori, heard her story. We mm-hmm. all sort of walked, you know, with her through it. And so like we finished the set and I go over to the you know side across the, you know, across the room. And I think you were in the production booth or, mm-hmm. you know, and we had shot this story. Like we, you know, we were aware of what, of right. what she said and all that stuff. And we're watching the story. And I just remember having this, this moment, um, where like, as I'm hearing her tell the story and as I'm watching this, like these, I, I remember thinking, I want to do this forever. This is like, I want to, I want to reach people for Jesus. I want more of this. And then I remember thinking of some names of people that went through my head of people that, you know, that need Jesus. And they were all in Fresno. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm just going to tuck that away. And then like, I don't know, a week later, a few days later, we went on a double date with our wives and we're in the car on the way home. And you guys sort of reluctantly were like, Hey, I, we kind of want to go back to Fresno. And cause I think you were afraid that if you told us that we would be upset cause we had just moved right. there. You had moved like a year earlier or something like that, a year and a half. I can't mm-hmm. remember. And I'm like, you guys just moved up here to work with us to move towards this dream of San Francisco. But I hate to tell you, but when Lori was baptized, God broke my heart for people in Fresno. Yeah. It was like the same exact, the same exact kind of experience from yeah. across the room without speaking to one another. Yeah. And that was just a confirmation of God's thumbprint on everything mm-hmm. that, that he had he had planted the seeds so long ago 
of purpose and then watered and, you know, took care of the soil and then moved us to different soil. Yeah. And helped us to grow in a lot of ways and then said, okay, go back. And in our minds, the different soil meant we were going to eventually go to San Francisco, but God knew all along. Right. You're never really going to make it there, but that's okay. We're going to, you can be motivated by that. Yeah. That's okay. But I've got a plan for you. So we said, let's move back and let's start a new church for the people that we know and love in Fresno who are not connected to and don't really have a relational connection to pull them into any of the local churches. Because there's a ton of great local churches in our area. That wasn't the issue. The issue was these people, these specific people, we just felt a call to go minister to, to go be the church for. So we moved back. Uh, not too long after that conversation, actually, yeah. it was pretty quick, and it was a it was a messy move. Yeah, it was very messy. A lot of bumps, but but we got back. And I remember what's what's crazy is like when we came back, there were a couple of things because we were you know part of the North Point network and and you know listening to Andy Stanley and and um, and that whole crew all the time. And right. and I remember when we came back, Jeff Henderson had just rolled out this you know for for Gwinnett, you know this this in Gwinnett County they you know started a North Point campus and. And the idea was that, you know, most of the time people identify the church with what they're against mm-hmm. and not, not what they're for. And so we want to let it be known we are for our right. county, for Gwinnett County. And that habit, we resonated with that. Yeah. Huge. So we came, you know, we, we were like, we are two cities. Right. Um, you know, Jill Dowdy uh, came up with the name, the two cities. Two cities. Um, I, like there were all these meetings of like li- other people that, you know, like we kind of brought in right. to this mix that, that we're now like sharing in the vision. So it was really cool to watch as we gathered some, you know, core people around and you, and you see these story and you hear mm-hmm. their, you know, their impressions of it. And, and, you know, someone, I think, you know, Darren and Talani pointed out the four Gwinnett stuff and Jill named the church and, you know, it's all these yeah. different things. Um, and then at the same time, Andy Stanley, you know, preached a, a message where he, um, uh, he rolled out this idea of like, um, don't make a point, make a difference. Mm-hmm. And so I think those two ideas, like, you know, being known for what we're for and, and making a difference rather than a point, those resonated with us in a, in a huge way. Right. And I think it wasn't as if like we heard it and it was like, oh yeah, we should do this. It was sort of like, at least for me, we heard it and was like, that's what I've been feeling yeah. for all these years. And that's, that's how, when I, when I first was exposed to um, Andy Stanley's teaching style and their ministry style, that's how I felt. It was like, you finally have given me language to express what I already know. Yeah. Because I just had a way to say it. I didn't have a way to say it. I hadn't seen it. But suddenly I saw something that resonated that felt like, this is what I'm shooting for. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was exactly the same same kind of thing. Yeah. So it, it, you know, as I was reflecting on this and thinking about this, you know, today I was like, Oh yeah, every, every stop along the way we've, we've wanted to make a difference. We've wanted to do that together. Right. And, um, and then, then we got to this point where I was like, okay, now we're here in our hometown. We went like Fresno to LA to Fresno to San Francisco to Santa Rosa to go back down to Fresno. And but like, we're here. We're back right. at, we're back in Fresno Clovis. Right. And, and so it's like, okay, now, now go now, now build this thing. And that was seven years ago. We started, you know, doing yeah, preview, we, we actually had services. We had, so when we moved, it was all like small groups. Mm-hmm. We started some small groups that met, I think we did two or three or four at a time and they were in different homes and it was all small groups and we would have a vision night once a month. Uh, First Baptist Clovis let us use their facilities for that. Um, we did a we did a baptism slash night of worship thing at uh, at the bridge. At the bridge, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and then Clovis Hills let us do a couple of night of wor- like a Christmas night of worship thing there. And so we had these different churches that allowed us to use their facilities um, for different things. And uh, we're just these little nomads, you know, going around from yeah. place to place and and really the people not every not everyone on our our list of people that we wanted to reach we reached mm-hmm. but they were used as motivation to get us here and then we reached 
uh, people we didn't even know. And, and some of those people though did, you know, they came and they stuck. Um, and so it was a, it's a, a crazy, crazy, I've never heard another church planting story like ours. Yeah. Absolutely unique. I think they're all unique in their own way, but ours is just so, so crazy. Yeah. And so when we finally started Sunday services, it felt like a huge, huge deal. I remember this. We had, our systems were so well, so well done. And I had a coach from this church planting network come and he came to our launch service and he was like, you guys are like the, uh, the smallest mega church I've never heard of because all of our <laughs> systems were like perfect. Yeah. We had it dialed in, you know, we knew, how to run we knew what service. we, we knew what we wanted to do. We knew how we wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we struggled getting the mass of people yeah. to the, to the event of church. And so it's always, it's been like an up and up and down thing with that. Right. So it hasn't been easy the whole time. There's been struggles. There's, we've had people that have come in, their lives have been changed and then for one reason or another, they move out of town or they move on. And that's always heart wrenching. Like it hurts anytime someone leaves something that you've built, uh, yeah. especially if they've been there for a long time and you know, you, you can't satisfy everyone, but, um, but there's always been this, that's okay. God's in charge. He, he will work it out. Yeah. Whatever's supposed to happen. Um, and well, and along the way, keep there, going. <laughs> there, there were a lot of lessons about, I think, trusting God for me. Anyway, there was a lot of like God teaching me that he doesn't need me. You know, that like, I, you know, I, I, I've often thought like, oh man, God is lucky to have me on, on the squad. And, <laughs> um, and you know, that's not really true. Right. Like God doesn't need Paul, you know, but, uh, you know, like it was, I was, I came back and didn't have a job. Like, in fact, just before, shortly before we left New Vintage, my, my, uh, the church was broken into and my guitar, um, oh, right. $4,000 guitar was, uh, and case and all that stuff was under my desk. And so they stole the guitar. And so I got an insurance check, but then when we said we were, you know, leaving, then it was like, okay, you can leave now and, and whatever. And so I came back to Fresno with no, no right. job, no money. So my guitar, my insurance check covered our, you know, covered us and like live with my parents. I'm a 30 year old with, you know, two kids now and living with my parents, every 30 year old man's dream. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, but you know, Eric Baumgartner, who was one of the early, like him and Tracy right. were like an early, you know, adopters to this thing, early, early part of the church. He ran a power plant in Chachill <laughs> and got me a job there. I'm a musician. I'm not a manual labor guy. And Eric got me the gig. And so like, I remember is, you know, 17 months of driving there, 45 minutes there, working a 12 hour shift, 45 minutes back. Do it, you know, it's like on four days off for two, you know, just crazy, right. crazy schedule. I remember hating every minute of it mm -hmm. and just wrestling with God, like, God, let me tell you the 97 different ways that you could get me out of this and get me back in the game. Like you, you need me here. And I, I think it wasn't until, until I finally was like, okay, if you want me to do this for the next 10 years, I'm in, I don't get it, but I'm in. Right. And and that's when he was like, okay, sweet. Now we can move on. And, <laughs> and like, there's just those kind of lessons that I think we all learned throughout the process, especially in the early days of, you know, trust and dependency and right. realizing that our expectations of what yeah. was going to happen were not totally. necessarily what God had planned, whether it's going to San Francisco or, you know, having a, like, I remember <laughs> it's still going to happen someday, but like, I, I, you know, shared with you before our first service, I was like, I'm what I kind of think is going to happen is there's going to be, you know, a line around the corner and I'm ready to admit, to stand up on this bench here and make an announcement and say, everybody, we are at max capacity, but come back in an hour and we'll do this again. Right. <laughs> and that was sort of like one day that's going to happen. And, um, you know, it may not, but like, I, I think throughout this whole process, there's been this. <laughs> There's been this sense that um, that God's the one that's going to move this thing or not move this thing, and mm -hmm. and God's yeah, going to do it. He doesn't need us. Absolutely true. 
That's absolutely true. Because I think I think there's been lots of points of frustration. Why aren't things moving faster? You know, we've had several uh, venue changes. Yeah. Right. Uh, we leased a small space for a year. We tried to do multiple services to try to you know have better capacity, and we we're trying to get to that point, but just move the make the room smaller. Yeah. And uh, and it was just it it was bleeding us dry financially. Mm-hmm. And it became all about how do we, you know, like my week, so much of it was taken up by how do we maintain this space more than how do we grow this ministry for people? And so I hated it. It was draining me. So then we went back to Portable Church. Mm-hmm. Portable Church for uh, for a year and a half again. Yeah. And then uh, the the wheels fall off with COVID. So, so there was a lot of, there's been a lot of ups and downs with, with planting a church has not been at all what we expected. Right. We've had to, um, we've had to adjust our expectations, change our expectations and then do it again and then do it over and over again. We've all, we've all, uh, mourned some of that. We've grieved some of that, but then there's been some really exciting things that God has done. And I think one thing that I've learned is to be really excited about the smallest thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not so small, but it, it feels small. Be so excited about one story, two stories, three stories, whatever, individual stories. Yeah. So instead of, um, I never look at, okay, we've baptized X amount of people. I look at, we baptized this person. Yeah. You know, we, we uh, led this person to Christ. This person is growing in their faith and bringing their family to faith because of uh, what God has done through us, not yeah. because of us, but because what he's done through us, because nothing is ours. Um, we've done. Yeah. I mean, like there, there are stories, um, you know, on that initial list, right? Like one of the people that you had on there was Eric Medeiros and Jamie, his wife at the time, like mm-hmm. Jamie was baptized at two right. cities Yep. and you know, and Eric's coming to two cities now. Like Eric's in a small group. Eric's in your small group. Like, and that's a whole nother story. I'll have Eric on the podcast sometime yeah. and we'll tell uh, some of that. I don't know if we'll tell everything, but we'll tell some of that story. Yeah. We were we were praying for my brother and his then wife, Trish, yep. and my nieces, yep. Hannah and Elise. That's right. And their marriage ended, but in that process, like Trish started coming. And that's where she met Tony, who's her husband now. And my nieces go to our church right. and are like engaged. Mm-hmm. And it's this amazing thing of, you know, these. it's not... It's not this, you know, overwhelming tidal wave of, you know, right. uh, of, you know, uh, large groups of people, but it's individual people like Donnie Bolton. I went to elementary school with right, and hadn't seen him forever. All of a sudden I walk into a small group here and Donnie's here and I'm like, Donnie, Donnie got me a job where I work now. You know? <laughs> yeah. And Donnie came to Jesus. He got baptized at two cities and has been one of our most faithful volunteers and Amy like runs children's ministry. Now. So it's That's this, right. it's this crazy thing of, you know, these, these individual lives, these individual people, um, that, ha- that have been in the process. I think looking back on it, I think, you know, there's one thing that I've learned. It's that there's absolutely a God and I'm not him, right? <laughs> like there's someone else in control. It's God. And he's taken us on this path that like we could have never laid this out. Oh, no way. We would not have laid this out. Right. Why would you? We would have said, no. (sighs) Yeah. I'm good. Thank you. Why would we have gone through this whole problem? But but here we are. And now, you know, COVID comes and I think we've sort of, I don't know, it's it's ingrained in our culture. uh, Okay, we're going to do different things. You know, so we took all of that, like, we know how to put stuff together. We know how to run a church service. We know how to, you know, engage people's hearts and and all that stuff. Um, and, And we sort of applied it in a digital format, you know, and now here we are telling the story. And so it looks incredible. Like initially we thought it's a, it's a large church in San Francisco. Right. And now we're a small church in Fresno, mostly online, but it's, so it looks completely different than we thought, but it totally different. It's uh, I mean, if, if, if we would have predicted this, we'd have been like, well, let's just stay in Santa Rosa. We could do it all online. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, or we could live wherever, you know, but we didn't, 
we didn't pre- predict that. And we have so many roots here. It's just, this is home. Yeah. But, but I, I think at the end of the day, like the calling really is not to go and start a church. It's not to go and build a building. It's not to go and draw a crowd. It's not to do any of those things. It is to be a light. It is to follow Jesus wherever he leads, whatever he says to do, like we just go. And that has taken us in the 23 years we've known each other. That has taken us through all kinds of twists and turns and ups and downs and uncertainties. Yeah. Yeah. Like there were times where you were eating potentially toxic pizza, uh, on a regular basis. There were times where, uh, someone actually trusted me behind the wheel of heavy equipment, you know, like, there's a lot after of, your man lift ish, you know, after accident. my man lift thing, so yeah, all sorts of crazy. Didn't put that on the resume. Um, yeah, like my first day driving that thing on my own. By the way, like I almost tipped it. Oh, I remember you telling the story. I was you were terrified. Out. I when I left that job the first day, I met Jen, and I was like, we were in a restaurant, and it was all I could do not to just bawl and cry, because I was like, what is going on with my life? But you know, looking back on it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade it for the world because the whole process has been this discovery of who God is. It's those individual stories that you're talking about, right? Those individual people. And it's an opportunity for my kids and your kids to see, to see this whole thing, you know, to see it all unfold, um, to see, to see steps of faith. Yeah. Cause that's the whole thing is like taking a step of faith without knowing all the details. That's what taking a step of faith is. Yeah. So if you know all the details, it takes all the mystery out there is, there's no real faith in the mystery of it. It's, but when you don't know how it's all going to work out, when you don't know how it's going to come together, when you don't know, for instance, when we moved here, we didn't know where we were going to live, you know, like a couple weeks before we moved. Yeah. So it's really cool to see our kids witnessing us taking steps of faith. Mm-hmm. It's just a huge deal. Yeah. Well, and I, like, I, I, I don't know. I think this whole, all of the, the ups and downs, all of the, you know, misdirects and, and, you know, the whole thing has, I don't know, prepared us for this season in some way. Like not that we were prepared for the pandemic, but it's given us a sense that no matter what is thrown at us, Mm -hmm. we can a trust God and B we can adapt. Right. You know? And so now we've become this online church in a world where, and, and, and have a unique opportunity to be a voice of, um, I don't know, of peace in the middle. Like when everything online is, you know, everything is chaotic. One, Everything's fighting. Everything is yeah. extreme. What's so funny. Like we, we live in this world where, you know, it, it's black and white, right? You're on this side or that side, you know, it's, you know, you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, you're rich or you're poor, you're white or you're black, you know, like whatever it is. Um, and, and people, I think they, they misunderstand because they, th- they think if you're not, on the extreme of one side or the other, then you're just gray. Right. And that's not the truth. The truth would be, what would the truth be about? I mean, it would be like, no, you're, you're in color. You know, you're not, right. You're not just in gray. You're not just meshing it, but you're actually seeing things a little clearer. Like between black and white is a full spectrum of color. (laughs) Right. Right. Which is crazy to me, you know, like that, that, you know, I don't know. We live in this world where like, you have to agree on every issue, like all of these these issues that we that we argue about, whether it's politically or even within the church or or wherever. You know, I don't know. There's there's very few like absolutes in this world, and so everyone is like, you either if you're for Black Lives Matter, you hate the police. Well, that's not really true. If you're if you're for this, then you hate that. If you but people don't really operate that way. Like the majority of Americans, the majority of people around us, you know, have a, have a spectrum of, of views right. and, and you right. know, we're, we're individual people, just like we've been connected to this idea of celebrating individual stories. We're so quick to, you know, in this, in, in our world, we're so quick to put people into different categories like, Oh, you must be on that side or you must be on that side. When in reality, it's like if, if we would take the time to, to again, make a difference and not a point, it would, it would, you know, it would change everything, you know, to really get to know people and make a difference in their lives rather than, you know, yeah. declaring what we stand for. That's, and that's been our heart from the beginning. We did, 
from the beginning, we've tried to partner with other people in town who are trying to do something good Mm -hmm. in our town, whether it be Habitat for Humanity or an organization that sought to feed chronically hungry kids in Fresno or the Fresno Mission. You know, like we, we're like, let's be for these, these people, not, I I don't want to say causes because it's really people underneath that. So we're not really for or against causes. We're actually for people. And that's what we want to be known for. So that's why we try to do a lot of things in the community. As much as a church our size can do, we try to do. Yeah, Man, this has been a really fun conversation. Is there anything like last thoughts you have? You'll be back on the podcast sometime. But, you know, for this episode, coming coming up to our sixth anniversary, as we celebrate six years of operating as the church, um, is there any last kind of thoughts about that? It would be great if we were a church that was for people, that was for our community, right? You know, it goes back to that idea of for, F-O-R, right? Like mm-hmm. the church in throughout history and, and, you know, the modern church has often been known, you know, for what they are against, right? The church stands on this issue and that issue and this issue and that issue. And in reality, every single individual person in the church makes up the church and every individual person has different views, ideas, you know, beliefs. And so, um, you know, for the essentials, we want to have, uh, unity, and, and for the non-essentials, we want to have charity. And, you know, for everything else, we just need to have grace. Right. You know, if we were a people of grace, it would it would really change everything. Right. I think that's well said, Paul. I think that if we could just continue to not get caught up in, in the bickering and the fights that are not necessary, and we can be a voice of peace and hope and love through Jesus— mm-hmm. I mean, what else are we going to be called to do other than that? I mean, that's exactly that's what we want to do. We want to love God, and really, the way that we authenticate our love for God is by loving others, by by showing our love for others. Which ultimately, the point of that is to show God's love to them. So, well, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Love you. Thank you for being a part of this journey with me. Hopefully, we get you know at least fifty six more years i don't know i don't even do the math but that sounds pretty good uh don't do it don't do it don't do the math because then it's going to cut short um no i mean it's going to be shorter than i was thinking it was going to be so uh so yeah hopefully we have a long road ahead of us where we can continue to make a difference uh not just a point and be known for what we are for yep exactly we're gonna play you out now with a song from one way no we're not it's not gonna happen Nope, it's not going to happen. Don't do it. You're thinking about it. Don't do it. No, the boy band days are over. I traded in my cargo pants. They're just, it's over. I still have the turtleneck sweater. But. <laughs> no, you don't. Well, if you watched this entire conversation, God bless you. Thank you for hanging with us. And I can't wait to bring you some more conversations about how people are being the church physically wherever they find themselves. And specifically, the people who call themselves Two Cities Church. We want to share more of those faith stories and journeys. So I can't wait to bring you the next episode. Until then, God bless you, and I hope to see you online.